Greg. Here. James. Here. Alex. Here. Justin. Here. Jen. Here. I'm here. Mike. Here. Julie. Here. Peter. Mary. Well, everyone's here tonight. Um, we're going to move on to uh, a, a presentation uh, by Betsy O'Neill, Chapag Valley Partnership. Oh, and Allie O'Hara is too there. I'm sorry, I didn't even see Allie. I should have looked up. I'll start and then Betsy will take over. Um, I'm Allison O'Hara. I'm the Director of Pupil Personnel Services here in the region. And uh, we're here to talk tonight about uh, Chapag Valley Partnership. For the new um, board members that haven't been a part of the conversation around Chapag Valley Partnership, this is our program for our 18 to 21 year old students who um, have completed all their academic requirements at Chapag, um, but continue to need some um, strengthening of independent living and vocational skills. And so I uh, just wanted to give an update. This is year two of our program. Uh, we have changed location. Uh, we uh, were lucky enough to be gifted a, a, a space in the depot last year uh, to get the program up and running. And then we were lucky enough to be able to uh, find a space in town hall this year, which has been really uh, a wonderful place to be. Uh, and additionally, we have um, some new students. We started our program with two students uh, in the 18-19 school year, and now we have four students in our program and a fifth student joining us next year. Uh, two of our students are from out of district, so we have some students that are Region 12, uh, from Region 12, and then also from a local district who uh, realized that we had a program up and running and came and visited and, and um, tuitioning into, our tuitioning in two students. Um, so the first part that, the first piece that we thought would be a really nice uh, way to, to share a little bit about our program is we have, uh, the, the reason the program is called a partnership is because we work with businesses as partners. And so we asked some of our businesses to give us uh, some feedback as far as what the, their experience has been thus far. So I believe you have a handout, and I know some of these will get smaller and smaller print, and I, I don't want to read everything word for word, but we have two wonderful people from town hall that indicated that uh, Having the students and our job coaches and our, and our director, uh, Betsy O'Neill, in the town hall has made such a difference to the day-to-day -day life there. Um, and so we're just really proud that we have a place there, but also that they're finding us to be wonderful neighbors in the um, building. And so, again, um, another person from the town hall talking about the energy that we bring to the space and the wonderful uh, students and the way they greet and um, are able to... Uh, you know, do their work within that uh, space and just how it's supporting uh, not just our students, but the, but the life at Town Hall. Uh, additionally, Aspatuck Animal Hospital has given us some feedback or has written um, some information for the board to hear a little bit about their work with our students. Uh, they've been working with us for a couple of years, uh, not just with our um, Chapag Valley Partnership, but also with several of our students who have job shadowed and, and had some work experiences there. Um, but uh, the role of our students has been really important to uh, supporting their day-to-day -day work that often falls by the wayside when they get very busy. And so just sort of singing the praises of our students and their job coaches to make sure tasks are getting completed and, he and helping the business. Additionally, um, Salem Covenant Church wrote us quite a big um, um, kind, kind words uh, about our work there. Um, in the last year, we began a relationship with Salem Covenant Church. Uh, Mrs. O'Neill has worked very hard to find appropriate placements for students in areas of interest. And we had a particular student who was very interested in the housekeeping aspect of things and has begun to do some work at Salem Covenant Church now uh, for a little, com coming on, you know, half a year, a little more than half a year, started it at the end of the school year last year and has done, um, come back to that work again this year. So just some kind words that we thought you'd like to read about our program. Um, and before we go on, um, I want to introduce Betsy O'Neill. She is our lead teacher. She is our work study coordinator here at Chapag and the director of our Chapag Valley Partnership. 
Uh, I have some people here, also uh, job coaches that are here tonight. I'd love for them to stand for a minute. Uh, Tammy Beatty um, is one of our job coaches that started last year um, with Betsy, um, sort of spearheading this program. Um, and then next to her is Rachel Stone, who is a brand new job coach this year working uh, with our students. And next to her is Shauna Godchalk, who is also uh, a job coach working with our program. Tracy Webelard was not able to come tonight, but she is also our, our fourth job coach because we do have four students and each of them has their own job coach in their work. Um, and then I'm going to let Mrs. O'Neill take over a little bit. How are you? So I'm just going to go over a, our day, how our week goes. On Monday, Monday we do our morning work, which is typically stuff that is from their IEP. Then we go to phys ed and we work out for two hours. We go to the bank when we get back, usually depositing their paycheck or withdrawing money should they need it to go shopping at the market. Then we go shopping at the market. Then we buy lunch, or we buy items to make lunch. Then we do our afternoon work, which is typically work from the morning that we have not finished. And then we have leisure time, because we know that every adult needs leisure at the end of a hard day. <laughs> so they choose what they would like to do for leisure time. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we do morning work. We have a community job. So all of our students go out and they work. They make minimum wage. They come back. They fill out their timesheet. And then they work on their other work. So if they have morning work that they haven't finished, they also complete that. Then we have leisure. On Friday, we do our morning work. We go to phys ed for two hours. We work out. Then we have our outing, our community-based instruction, where we go out to the community, and whether we go to a grocery store or a business, we learn about it. We may do a tour. Then we come back. We do our afternoon work, and then we do leisure. So it's a very busy, jam-packed day for these guys. So two other important guests that are here this evening are going to share about their days at um, Chapaug Valley Partnership, and that is Alicia Crossley and Patrick Levine. Do you want to come up? Here I go. My name is Patrick, and this is my second year at SVP. Last year, I worked at Washington Market. This year, I work three days a week at Aztec Animal Hospital. Some of my jobs are vacuuming, cleaning the bathrooms, sweeping laundry, new puppy or kitten packs, and poop patrol. Hi, my name is Alicia. This is my second year at SVP. Last year, I worked at Washington Pizza. This year, I work three days of at home goods. I build lamps, stocked fluffy pillows, and help clean shelves. I love my job. Sorry. Oh, on Monday we go to the bank and deposit our paycheck. We take money out if we don't have enough for the week. After the bank, we go to the market and buy lunch or buy things to make our lunch.
on Monday and Friday, we all go to phys ed and work out. We write our workout and our fitness journal. Our fitness journal helps us to be independent because we choose our own workout. So sometimes I take Zumba, Pilates, or p Power Pump class. So, this is our world of adulting. This is where we start. Alicia and Patrick are two of our stellar stars and our role models for the new students that are there currently. Some of the things that we do, we do daily living and planning such as, well, what's the weather gonna be like? What's the weather like outside? Because of that, what should we wear? We talk about work. We talk about things that they like at work. We talk about leisure activities and changing it up and not always doing the same thing that sometimes we may like to do a word search and other times we, like, we may like to go on the internet and search or we may like to listen to music. We talk about healthy cooking and making healthy choices for food. We budget for the week. So when we go to the bank on Monday, they determine what, what they're gonna spend approximately and then that, that determines what they take out of the bank for the week. Community safety, crosswalks, huge, parking lots, even bigger, and emergencies. When to call 911, when not to call 911. Lifelong fitness, going to phys ed is huge. They're all independent. They can get onto a bike, do their warm up for 10 minutes. When they're done, they know to get off and go either to strengthening or cardio. Yes. And elliptical. The elliptical. We go shopping. We buy food, clothing, and gifts for birthdays, Christmas, holidays. We dine out, fast food. We try to stay away from the fast food. Um, and sit down restaurants where they order. They usually get separate checks so they can each pay on their own, determine the tip, and leave that for the waitress. And all that money is money that they've made from their job. We also talk about community services, libraries, what the police do, the fire department. Ready, Pat? Come on over. There you go. Are you? On Fridays, we do community outings. My favorite community outings are going to the movies and going out to lunch. When I go to the market, I decide what I want to have for lunch. I go to the deli and order a sandwich and then choose a drink. When I'm done, I go to the cashier and pay for my food. I make my own decisions and pay for my lunch with my own money. So giving back to the community, it's important that the students know that giving back is something that we do as adults. So whether you volunteer, whether you provide food to a food bank, or you go into the store, you purchase food, and you donate it. This is what happened when we went to Stop and Shop one day to buy our food. And they, they gave back. They each bought something with their own money, and they gave back. We also donated to the Washington Warren Food Bank, 
and they purchased items with their own money as well. Or maybe Lynchman. Absolutely. So we're wondering if you have any questions. Their lives, you prepare them to live in the community as functioning citizens. Yes. Yeah. That's pretty good. And our door is always open. Come visit. Come visit. Although we're not always there, so I mean, <laughs> we're either, come to phys ed with us and come come watch us work out. No. But we're all, the door's always open. It's been a great year, lots of growth. Thank you, thank you. I don't know who uh, Lisa? came up with this wonderful idea, but I I think it's fabulous. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Okay. You're terrific. Lisa? I just want to say thank you, and this has been great. But Alicia, I've known you since you were at REACH, and you have come so far, and I'm so proud of you and Patrick. So thank you both so much for a great presentation. Mike? Yes, thank you. Um, I know one of the things that you had talked about was trying to move beyond Washington, which, which is kind of your home base, and moving into other communities, and certainly you know, phys ed is in uh, New Milford, and I'm wondering, are you going to continue to plan to look at out, uh, other communities other than Washington? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I need to do next year, and I'm already thinking about it, which I know drives my job coaches nuts, is that I'm already looking at other places, for example, where, where Pat lives, that I need to find a place closer to his home so that he's in his community. Whereas Alicia is in this community, so New Milford is the ideal spot for her. I try not to go too far because the bus ride is long. So if I, the closer I can get it, the better. But I do my best. I just want to say, well, I'm so impressed with their presentation because you guys both did a wonderful job. And I'm very jealous because all of you work at my favorite places, between Home Goods, the pizza place, and Aspetuck Animal Hospital. I think I'm definitely going to come visit so I can selfishly come shop and hang out with you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. We are going to move on uh, to recognizing uh, our art students. So I'm going to turn this over to our superintendent. Good evening. What a wonderful showcase of just talent today and talking about going the entire gamut of bringing our students from arts to the world around them to we will later see some project lead the way. So I'm very excited to showcase it all. Um, so I have the honor of recognizing our art students for February. And what happens is, is the displays that you see in front of you are all the representations of our artists. For the next two months, they are held in our central office. So I get to look at these each and every day. And so I th thank you so much for loaning them to me and we will give them back after we are done housing them at central office. So our first student that I would like to recognize from Booth Free School is Brianna Johnson. Brianna, can you please come up? <laughs> Brianna, what grade are you in? Fourth. She, fourth grader, okay. And who is your art teacher? Miss Manley. Fantastic, and do you love art? Yes. Yeah. Would you mind standing up right over there and looking glamorous so that way when we get all of our artists up, people can take one picture. So can I have you stay there? Thank you. Our next artist I would like to invite up from Burnham Elementary School is Noah Tenrano. Did I say that wrong? Tenrero? All right, come on up. You're going to have to correct me. <laughs> all right, Noah, can you say it correctly for me? Tenrero. Tenrero. Excellent. And can you win again next time so that way I can practice saying it a lot? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And who is your teacher? Miss Manley. And do you love art? Yeah. 
and I see great things in your future. So can you please go stand up next to my friend Brianna, please? And our next student we'd like to rec recognize is Liam Meyer from Washington Primary. Liam, come on up. Congratulations. And who is your teacher, Liam? Um, Miss Stella Rada. Miss Stella Rada, so that's your homeroom teacher? So that means you're in first grade? Yeah. Excellent, and are you rocking first grade? Yeah. Excellent, I can tell that you're doing a great job in art as well. Can you please go stand next to my friends over there? <laughs> All right, and our middle school representative this month, I'd like to invite up Gavin Abdella. Gavin, I've looked ahead in the schedule and you're coming up a lot today, aren't you? Yes. Excellent. So um, is art your favorite subject? Yes. And Project Lead the Way? Yes. And anything else we're going to represent you with today? No. no. Okay, excellent. Can I have you go stand over there with our other artists? <laughs> and at this time, I would like to invite up from high school, we have Lane Faison. Congratulations. And Lane, you've been very busy, I believe, with your photography and your artwork. Anything you want to share with everyone? Um, I'll be going to a Scholastic Art Awards in Hartford later uh, this week. Fantastic, so the awards keep on coming. Excellent, can I have you please go stand up there? And if I could please invite my friend Ben up to make certain we get a picture of our artists. So here's where you have to get your best smile because we're gonna put you on our website. Oh, I'm sorry, did she call me? <laughs> there we go. Liam, can you turn it towards us? Turn it so I can see it. Nicely done. Excellent. I thank you all and round of applause for our artists. lead the way. Yeah. All right, at this time I'd like to invite Sheila Gambino to come up and we're going to uh, look into Project Lead, Project lead the Way and uh, Robotics Mini Tech Expo presentation. And while Sheila comes up, I do want to acknowledge our students. We have Isabella Fazone, we have Nicholas Brown, we have Jack um, Bolkholtz, we have Isaac Fitch, David Lowe, Ellie Brighamton, Reese Evans, Antonia Kearney, Jacob Tendler, Hayden Fisher, Gavin Abdella, Griffin Bloom, uh, Matthew Buell, uh, Gavin McCont, Annabella Brownbach, I, I, Griffin, oh, Griffin's mentioned twice, we like it so much, and I have Faith Barnjelly. Did I miss anybody? Okay, what's your name? Cadence is here too. Cadence, what's your last name? Uh, I need to make certain Cadence O'Keefe is heard. So thank you, Cadence. I appreciate you all being here. Mr. Gambino. Um, called 3D modeling and animation. I don't know if this is on, Ben. Is it on? Okay, thank you. So um, the first group of students I would like to introduce to you are um, some students that you've probably heard their names before. They were state finalists for the Samsung Solve for Tomorrow competition in which they won a Samsung tablet for the classroom, which we will be using to fly some of the five drones that I was able to secure through a fellowship at UConn over the summer. So um, that's very exciting, but they wanted to give you kind of an update on the project of where it stands. So I know Superintendent Bennett already offered her congratulations to them at a previous board meeting. Jack Buckles, Nick Brown, and Bella Fazone, and Sean Bennett is missing right now. Okay. <laughs> 
Hello, everybody. Um, as you know, we are. Oh, okay. Um. Yeah, the, oh. the microphones don't amplify. They're just recording you. So. Uh... Oh, okay. Okay. Out on video. Go. Sorry. Hello, everyone. My name is Isabel Fazone. These are my partners, John and Jeff. <laughs> Sean. Jack Sean, Jack, and Nick. Um, you've already heard us introduced, so I guess there's no true need for that. <laughs> and we're here for the our Goose Project, as you know, hopefully. If not, um, the plan so far is to create a way to get rid of the geese that are, well, flocking to our pond outside the Chapag Valley High School. Just take it. Just take it. All, right. all right. So as said by my partner, Bella. All right. Um, yes, there are. Thank you, Mrs. Gambino. Um, there are geese flocking around our pond, pooping around and everything else that's going on over there. So that's our problem. The solution to our problem. So a, we all, the robotics group, we don't know very much about geese. So we decided to meet up with people who did. The Ag STEM kids. The Ag, the Ag STEM kids, yes. Um, through that meeting, we learned that coyotes are the natural enemy of geese. So it hit us like a freight train. Why don't we build like a sort of like a model coyote that can move to scare away the geese and pretty much solve our problem? Um, and we tried many different things. Uh, we obviously thought chicken would taste good, so we tried flamethrowers, but that wouldn't work. Uh, so we came up with the idea, like, Nick's, uh, like Nick said, that uh, geese are actually afraid of coyotes who are their natural predators. And we uh, found out that if we make the, the fake coyote stand still, they're going to eventually figure out that it's just... It's not a real coyote. But so what we're going to do is make this coyote move its head or its tail so that it looks like it's alive and walking or, and moving around so that the geese think that it's a live coyote and they don't want to go to that pond anymore. So how, how does this relate with all of these subjects? Well, so for animal science, animal science will create a, or agri-science, sorry, will create a wireframe of the coyote head or tail, and it'll be a scale replica with the average size of coyote, so that we just want to make sure the geese definitely know it's a coyote. Art is going to make the coyote look like a coyote, so that it's not just a wireframe art project sitting out in a field. Um, and Project Lead the Way uh, will make the head or tail uh, move, and also what's cool about this is we are going to make it self-sufficient so that we don't have to have someone go in the morning and night and replace the batteries, but instead it will be solar powered and we'll be able to work on its own. Okay, and the next group of students I'd like to share with you are the Project Lead the Way students, and also the robotic students have projects that they would like to share with you also. But um, we have students from 6th, 7th, and 8th grade Project Lead the Way in the back. And if you don't know what that is about, I'm going to show you a quick video. So Project Lead the Way is a pre-engineering program, and in sixth grade we start out with an introduction to engineering, and we talk a lot about design and modeling and how engineers use the design process to solve problems and cr create innovative ideas or products. They, the students work with a program called Autodesk Inventor, which is a professional 3D modeling program, and it's to build rapid prototypes of designs before an engineer puts a design into production and then wastes a lot of resources with something that doesn't work right. So the students learn these bigger concepts and they're able to use the 3D modeling program to first go through a series of tutorials and direct instruction with me, but then they're released 
to investigate the program on their own and they create their own original designs that they are able to print on the 3D printer, which they're really excited about. Hello, my name is Adriana and I'm in the class Project Lead the Way. What we do in Project Lead the Way is we learn about different engineers and their different careers. Right now, we're learning about how to draw like an engineer and the different sides of a shape. Hi, I'm Roxana. I'm going to show you a little bit about the 3D printer. Um, it prints a lot of things you, that you create on the computer. Uh, I help a lot of people with it. I learned to do it in like the first couple of weeks of sixth grade. Um, I have Ms. Gamino as a homeroom teacher, so I print like every day in the morning, and I help a lot of people, including high schoolers. In seventh grade Project Lead the Way, students learn about all different types of alternative energy and they create a website based on a research project that they do about one specific type of energy. They then create a model or a prototype to show and explain how that type of energy gets converted to electricity in technical terms. Hi, I'm Maggie. I'm Alyssa. And right now we're working in Project Lead the Way for seventh grade and we're working on this really cool and super fun project about alternative energy and we chose geothermal energy and we're making our own uh, model and you get to work with your friends. Students then use their research about alternative energy to create a video game about alternative energy in which they use computational thinking and learn the basics of computer programming, which is then easily transferred to eighth grade when they work with the VEX kits for robotics. Programming was really fun. Uh, so. We were supposed to do a game on hydroelectric power because that's what we learned in a game grade. When we were doing this, uh, it took a long time, but when you finish, it feels really, you feel accomplished, and it's like you, you work so hard on it. Students in eighth grade learn about robotics and automation, and they use the VEX robotics kits to first build mechanisms, and then they build a VEX test bed in which they can test out the different sensors to get used to the programming and learn what the different sensors do and what their value ranges could be. And then they are released to build one of 10 projects. So they have a lot of student choice and a lot of collaboration with robotics and automation. And it's amazing to see some of the projects that the students build and design themselves. So technology at Chicago is fun. We got to you get to study electrical and mechanical and computer engineering. We built this to test out the four sensors that um, Vex has to offer. It's, it's fun. Um, we're using a program called Robot C to program uh, robots, and we're going to work on a project that allows us to take real world problems and make a robot to solve that problem. The Project Lead the Way classes also afford the students the opportunity to experience and taste what the classes might be like in the upper grade levels. And then they're able to enroll in classes that they're really passionate about. So here you'll see a list of the classes that we offer at the high school level in grades nine through 12. And also, you saw a mix of um, older students and newer students in this video. I'm in the process of updating it, but I also do the um, middle school and the high school yearbook. So I'm in the middle of that process right now. <laughs> Usually when I present, it's after the yearbook pages are due. So um, I replaced most of the clips, but so a couple of them I still had to keep that way. And at this time, our students who have these great, creative, wonderful projects would like you to invite you back to see some of the projects. So you can take some time, play some video games. You can test out some of their robots and ask them questions. Okay, so enjoy.
All right, we're going to uh, reconvene the meeting. Uh, always a great night when we have our students here uh, teaching us about all the things they're doing. So I thought that was that was absolutely terrific in all of the all the presentations this evening. Um, the next item on our agenda is a tour of the new construction at the school. Uh, I think I've heard from a few people that are suggesting because of the number of items on our agenda, we might want to postpone that to another meeting. Uh, also, it's a bit muddy out there. To get to Building F might just be kind of ugly. So if, if no one objects, I would like to postpone that to our next meeting. I hear no objections. We will postpone that. Uh, next, we have uh, public comment. Is there any comment uh, from the public uh, on anything on tonight's agenda or, for that matter, anything else? And I see no public comment. So we'll move on to the consent agenda. Does anyone want to remove the sole item on the agenda, the Board of Education meeting minutes of January 27? If not, those will be deemed adopted. Um, we'll move on to reports, starting with mine. Um, this past. Uh, week or so, a little more, there have been some, there have been two presentations that I've had the privilege to attend at Booth Free School where there have been discussions uh, with, with parents uh, regarding the um, multi-age classroom uh, possibilities for Booth Free School. Uh, the superintendent has made it clear that we want, to, Booth is in a position where this is something we should consider now, not because we have to, but because it's, it's the opportunity to develop a program that will will stand us in good stead that's more geared toward the particular community and the needs of the school as opposed to being where you don't really have a choice and your classes are so small you have to do it. Uh, and um, you know, I think that, that I, I think the presentations were very good. I think there were a lot of good questions answered. I think there are a lot of concerns that parents have and I want we want to make sure that we listen to those and that we uh, and that we address them and deal with them uh, as as that project moves forward. Um, I also uh, don't know if you've had a chance to see the state's report of the next generation accountability. I'm excited to, to share with you that the state released their next generation performance reports and all three of our elementary schools uh, have uh, received the recognition as schools of distinction. Uh, and uh, Burnham for high performance, Booth for high growth, all students in ELA and Washington primary for high performance and high growth, all students in ELA. So this is a really fine distinction and it shows you that uh, the, the quality of our programs that will only get better uh, as we move forward with, um, with some of the initiatives that the superintendent has in, in, in mind. So that was uh, more or less my report and um, I'll turn it over to Megan. All right, good evening. Um, <clears throat> well, my report is, is a lot of just kudos and good things that are happening. Um, I want to thank Heidi Adele uh, for a hectic launch to their Quebec trip. Um, she was in communication with the travel company trying to rearrange in case the snow delay caused any problems. Um, and she just was on top of it, including some bus issues that happened along the way. And it's just, it's always good to know that when something goes awry, our students are so cared for and so loved that they, they handle it with grace and poise. Um, but I also need to recognize Kevin Smith, who works at the Town Garage in Washington, because um, when I was talking to him that morning, because there was going to be a delay, he said, what window do you need? meaning what time are we getting the bus out and getting it to Quebec? And I gave him our, about our 15 minutes, a half hour window, and he made certain that road was clear. He went multiple passes. So when you say that small communities work together in order to make certain our students have every opportunity, all members of our community. So a big thank you to Kevin Smith and his extra efforts. Um, I also want to thank our agri-science student, Emma Perone, who joined me um, in New Fairfield on Thursday night. Uh, Emma and I went to the Board of Education meeting over in New Fairfield. We are currently going to each one of our sending schools uh, for agri-science. I'm bringing the student from the town with me. Um, Emma presented each one of the board members with a pen, a bag, our new brochure, um, and my business card. And um, yeah, we're, we're marketing here. Let's not get ourselves. And um, I had a chance to show them some slides of what 
um, what our campus looks like now. And the theme that we're saying is thank you for believing in Chipog. And as I go through the slideshow, I then turn over the microphone to um, the student. And Emma's statement, I, I just want to share with this entire board. And what she told her hometown board of education was, I am grateful every day to go to Chipog. She says, I, I am so happy with my choice. I have never felt so welcomed. And she said, and so one of their board members asked, what do you like about Chipog? And she says, every day I get to go outside and do the thing that I, I've always wanted to do. And I'm even more sure of my career and wanting to be a veterinarian. And her mother yells out from the crowd, her first word was horse. And um, I, as I was leaving the presentation, I did get, um, I did get approached by a parent um, in New Fairfield who um, is now looking to put forth their application as well to be considered for this year. So it's one in which I have to say, going to the towns, there's a big difference when you feel appreciated it's also a big difference. We don't want their children to go off into the ethos. And so my, my statement has been, thank you for not only just believing in us, but recognizing we have the capacity to educate their children. And so wanting to make certain we have a we statement in that. Um, additionally, um, I will, on Thursday, Greg spoke of uh, our conversations at Booth Free. We are doing a six-part presentation of the multi-age uh, transition, making certain that we're first exploring what are the different models of multi-age, then going to justifications, um, then talking about survey re results and making certain that we're really responding to the questions of the community. Um, and so the next evening event we have is Wednesday. And at that time, we will talk about the survey feedback and also um, some plans going forward. So that will be on Thursday evening. Um, I want to say six o'clock, uh, six o'clock at Booth School. Um, and then I also just want to mention, Greg had mentioned the Next Generation Accountability Report, and we are immensely proud of our elementary schools. But I also want to commend Chapog staff for moving up from a level three to a level two. I think we can truly say that we are in the right direction with our focus on not only the standards, looking at curricular expectation and making certain we're driving those expectations. So I think we're all feeling very proud. A uh, couple of appointments that we have. Um, we have Christy Bloom is the elementary teacher for Booth Free. She will be uh, the first grade teacher until we have June 18th, 2020, so really the last day of school. Um, and Amy Davis, paraprofessional at Burnham Elementary School. Again, this is just the one year position. Um, and with that, that concludes my report. Uh, Jim. Christy Bloom, is she hired as the first grade teacher? I mean, what will happen after June 18th? Uh, after June 18th, um, depending on if we go to multi-age, I will not need that position. So it was a one-year hire. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll go on to the treasurer's report, John. Yes, uh, last week um, we met with Charles Heaven, who did um, presented the, um, the audit to us. Um, if you, I have a couple of pages to reference. So um, the audit is in the, uh, in the, uh, it's in the list of um, things that Debbie, Debbie provided. Um, and on page 66 to start, I just wanted to uh, note that um, the uh, financial findings, and uh, there are categories that Charles and the, and the auditors look at, and um, all these are governed by um, uh, the state uh, State uh, single single audit act, and it's uh, it's actually um, 
This is what governs um, Charles's report. And as you can see, there are no, um, no identified or significant deficiencies in all the areas are favorable, uh, including the um, internal control over financial reporting, internal control over major programs. Uh, and that's very good, actually. And, and it goes a long way in, um, in things like potential borrowing and bonding. On page six, the district has two kinds of funds, government funds, uh, which track the basic educational and operational services of the district and fiduciary funds, uh, which these are the funds which the district is the trustee for assets that belong to others. That's uh, student activity funds. And um, these are the funds that um, primarily uh, are getting transferred to National Iron Bank and all the uh, student activity funds, uh, oh, food service account. Page eight, uh, district expenses predominantly related to educating and caring for students was 17,598,442, 7.3% of the total expenditures. And, they, and you can see that um, the program expenses were actually $26,164,218, which was greater than what was actually budgeted. Um, the total budget production for 2018-2019 was $21,811,406. And um, the revenue collected that for that year was $32,203,606. So you can, when you get to the bottom of the page, um, page eight, it shows you the net position at the end of the year. And I believe, Nicole, did that equal the uh, state money for the ag, the state grant money for the ag. The state grant money that was sitting in our account as of June 30th inflates that net position number. Our net position number would have been similar to what it was last year, but because we had $4.9 million sitting in our construction fund, yeah. for the for funds that the state had advanced us with, that we hadn't yet paid over to the contractors, that number is inflated. By $4.9 million? Correct. So the um, so if you turn to page nine, general fund budgetary expenditures as of June thirtieth, twenty nineteen, was twenty one million six hundred fifty two thousand eight hundred and sixty dollars, or ninety nine point three percent of the budget. Uh, so that's where um, in the handout that Nicole just distributed. Yeah, that's where that uh, 158,547 was derived from. Um, and uh, the district was also able to put, uh, you know, money into the 1% fund and um, the the elementary school funds. So, um, there was, um, last year the state uh, legislature approved increasing the um, amount of money that can go into the 1% fund to 2%, except that that legislation, apparently, there was a, something in the wording that um, caused the complication in that regional school districts were not allowed to put the 2% until that gets straightened out in the legislature. So um, uh, there is a bill 
I think there's going to be a bill proposed to increase, you know, from one to two percent for everyone. So that's something that we can look at in the future. And that'll go a long way too when we want to do capital improvements. When uh, we go to the uh, to the Capitol for the day on the Hill, that was one of the things that I had uh, expected to speak with uh, Senator Berthel and uh, Representative O'Neill about to make sure that they were on board with that. Yeah, definitely. Us. I mean, it, it was explained that, you know, it was an oversight. Right. Why they didn't include the regional schools is, a, you know, I guess maybe our, you know, Senator Berthel and, and, and Art could tell you. I just want to make sure they don't forget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, Mike. Chad, could you refresh my memory? When um, do we have the conversation about um, dispersing the monies in the 1% fund and the elementary school funds? When, when do we have the conversation? Yeah, when, when will we be having that conversation? During the school year, is that coming up right oh, around that's... the time of the budget? Is it after the budget? Is it? it... <laughs> The elementary school fund is is a budgeted expenditure, so that's that goes. That doesn't have to have board approval. That's funded in the budget. The capital reserve transfer we'll talk about in March. When do we spend it? When the which one? The elementary or the capital? Well, either one would be. So the the capital reserve requires board approval to spend funds. The elementary school requires um, facilities and the superintendent to meet with the towns to determine what improvements will be made to the elementary schools. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in the, in the past the board was at least notified of what, what monies were going to be spent and on what items. Is that? From the elementary school? Yes. That's something the superintendent would report on after we had those meetings, yes. OK, correct. so and when, when would that report be coming through then, Megan? Let me get back to you after I talk to Don. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I, I think there's a time within in, within the leases with which we have those discussions. I'm not 100% certain it's ever worked out that we followed that because you, usually it's when we can get the selectmen together to discuss it and whatnot. So there's a there's several complications to the timing on it, but you, usually it's sometime in the in the spring because you want to get geared up for work to be done mostly in the summer if there's anything of significance. Yeah, I'm I'm flexible, but I know that in the past um, one of the complaints from the towns was that the board wasn't actually doing doing its due diligence as far as spending money on the elementary levels to to keep those properties up um that was not megan just so you know this was a while ago and it wasn't every year that this was a complaint but this was definitely a complaint in the past um uh, but, you know. but but that goes back a good 10, 11, 12 years. I guess that's showing, I'm showing my age here. Yeah, well, 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 ever since, about that, you and I came on the board at the same time, about 11 years ago, and at that period of time, that's when we started negotiating the leases. And we negotiated leases, we put that elementary fund in there, and it ended the concerns about our, about, you know, the maintenance of those schools, because they all got a fair amount of money in that, I guess it's been about nine or 10 years that those leases have been in place. So that's been just about a million dollars of, uh, of funds that have been put into the maintenance of the elementary schools, uh, which, you know, there were some complaints that it wasn't, it was unevenly handled in the past, but, right. but that's not any, the case any longer. And uh, in fact, uh, in, initially, the, there, there was interest by the selectmen in having some input and talking about what they wanted us to do. But after a while, they realized that we were actually taking care of the problems that were coming up, they, which they did no longer had to deal with as a result of that. And that was the idea. We wanted to be transparent and we wanted to make sure that we took care of those things. And I think we've succeeded in that. And uh, I think Don O'Leary's done a wonderful job in making sure he gets a handle on what needs to be done in the different buildings. And so that, that's more or less the way it's gone. As far as the 1% fund, we kind of pick at that at budget time. Now, a lot of times we'll decide if we don't want to budget something and we put it in the budget, we won't put it in, take it out of the 1% fund. I think it's important in view of the fact that we're looking at a referendum uh, on, on uh, bonding expenditures. Our capital needs are great, and that 1% fund can be our friend if we don't tap it for things we shouldn't tap it for and, and save it for things we should. I think we can, we can, it can help us get more out of the, you know, more money available for work on these buildings 
these ancient buildings, old buildings that we have. I mean, think about it. We're sitting in the newest building in the district right here, and it's 50 years old. And this is the newest building in the district. So, uh, and the oldest, I think, uh, that goes through the corner of Booth Free School that was a one-room schoolhouse that was built in 1856. That is an old building. And so as a result, it, the capital needs are great, and we've been taking care of it bit by bit, and it's, they're in reasonably good shape as a result. So anyway, but I think we hit that kind of at budget time, and then occasionally something comes up during the year where there's an immediate need, and we've used that fund to satisfy that need. And we had an issue with the pool once that needed, needed money uh, in the middle of the year. So that's my basic knowledge of it from years on facilities. No, we, uh, we pretty much use up that elementary school fund every year. There's not much of a balance in it now. And um, as of uh, June 30th uh, last year, there was $852,118 in the 1% uh, fund. And at the, um, the FNO committee, we're, we tossed around using some of that balance for um, the upcoming um, major projects rather than try to bond the entire amount, maybe we could use some of that 1% fund for some of the smaller things like, uh, well, the tennis courts are already um, encumbered, but some of these, just some of the other things. I, I know they talked about refacing the Booth School, but. So. Um, Can I just I'm, ask one more question too? Um, Megan, I don't know um, if at budget time we Speaking of being transparent, we, we provide to the public the usage of the elementary schools um, because all three buildings are open to the communities and they're extensively used. I don't, I don't know if the community, when they're thinking about the school budget, I don't know if they ever, if that ever hits their radar, but part of it might not be because we rarely ever, if ever, remind them of that. Um, and, and you bring up a very good point. And Nicole and I have actually talked about having a line item, which is um, the community use, just so that way we have a certain amount, number one, uh, cost of custodians that have to come in for some of the games, you know, having paper towels that are available and, and some of the other things. So this way um, we also get recognition of the fact we are truly partner, uh, partners with our community. So I, I think that highlighting some of that partnership is very important. That said, not reducing it, but to just make certain that we're also aware and attending to the fact of, you know, how are we making ourselves accessible to our communities? Two of the other things I'd like to highlight on the, on the um, audit. On page 52, non-certified employee retirement plan, uh, which has a total liability of 7,448,174. Yeah. It's a little bit lower than last year, that balance. Um, although Nicole has stated that um, she's, um, because of the mortality tables, people are living longer. So that, um, that actual retirement fund, um, you know, in order to cover all the possibility of, of the greater longevity, um, that means that the contributions will probably have to increase to, um, and it's been at 100% in years past, and which is great. I mean, Charles Heaven um, definitely um, commends us for having such a healthy balance in that um, non-certified employee retirement plan. I'm not gonna get into the state and pretend that I know anything about the state retirement plan because that's in pretty bad shape, but it definitely details it in this audit. Develop, devotes a lot, quite a few pages to it. The last thing I noted was um, page 57, the school lunch revenue, and this coincides with also what we're, we're trying to do with increasing uh, business at the, the lunch program, but <clears throat> you can see where um, the revenue uh, shortfalls the um, expenditures by about almost $30,000. So um, hopefully with the, with the awareness that's being created, there was an article in the Republican American and, um, and also the surveys that were sent out and things. So it behooves us to try to um, get some greater participation if we don't want to hemorrhage that 30,000 every year. And that's about all I, I have. I mean. 
John, thank you very much. Um, go on to committee reports. Uh, Mary, Cabe? And the National School Boards Association shows strong voter support for public schools and are opposed to taking away taxpayer money from them for for-profit charter and private schools. And I thought that was a, a, a good thing to note. Um, there's also a CABE Student Leadership Awards. And I hope our, there are two of our students will be able to participate in that. Um, they're either from uh, high and middle schools and are, are eligible to receive this award. Um, and I also talked about the, uh, the day on the Hill, um, some of the things that I wanted to speak with the senator and, and our representative about. Uh, the also, I was going to take that opportunity to, to speak about the um, removing the religious exemption for immunizations while I have them there. And also, in advance, I will find out if uh, Congresswoman Johanna Hayes will be there that day, and also um, the Senators Murphy and, and Blumenthal, and I will try to make sure that our kids get to speak with them if they're there. That's it. <laughs> OK. Yeah, John. You should try to bend their ear again about the uh, the possibility that of the state funding the entire tuition per ag. I will add that to my list. Actually, it would be more than the entire tuition. It would be, you know, be twelve thousand if they if they if they'll um, live up to that commitment. Yeah, that's a that's a good idea to to while they're there, we have the opportunity. So, Jim. Yeah, Mary, what is your position on removing the religious exemption? Excuse me? What is your position on removing the religious exemption for the... Um, and do you purport to speak for the board? Excuse me? Do you purport to speak for the Board of Ed? I just, what is your position? Uh, yeah, I was actually, when I was at the Cape Convention, um, and I brought this up at the, uh, the Cape, for the Cape Board, they had already decided that they were going to push to remove the religious exemption. So when I asked about it, they asked me if I would like to testify, and I said yes. Well, that's, um, that's also, your... I've been speaking to my my own physician and some other physicians about the the possibility of doing that. The mm -hmm. thing is, we have to remember that we are a public school, so we have to try to do the best for everyone, and not the people who pretty much believe that they should do this for their own for their own goods. We that's, have to. We that's have. That's fine. To. I just wanted to know what your position was that it should be removed. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think though, but we have to be. One thing we have to remember uh, when we when we speak publicly or are involved in things is that uh, we we're all members of the board of education, but we don't speak. None of us can speak. The, the only actually, I'm the only person that that can speak for the board, and. Uh, it, only because I'm the chair, uh, but other than that, you can't speak. When you speak, you should make it. You should make it clear that you're. This is your own opinion, unless you've been authorized by the board to do it. Uh, so it's, it's it's the nature of it. So it's important to do that uh, because if, if the board is going to take a position, if I'm going to speak and announce the board's position, it's because we have debated it and decided to take that position. And I think that's a critical thing that we you know that we we have here to make sure that we're. We're acting in the, in the public trust, and that's that's why it's very important. So you have to be very careful when you're when you're speaking at any event. If you're identified as a board of ed member, you should probably say that I'm. I'm you know, if, you're, if it's your opinion, you should say this is my opinion. I'm not speaking on behalf of the board. Uh, but but you know, you can go on to say how important it is. But I think you need to be careful uh, when you do that. Uh, okay, I'm going to move on to curriculum and educational programming, Mike. Uh, no report uh, this evening. However, we um, I should have one for our next meeting um, as we've got a uh, curriculum and uh, educational programming committee meeting right before our, our next meeting. So, Okay. Thank you. Uh, finance and operations. Alex. Yes. Um, uh, if you can remember back, we got snowed out of our meeting uh, two times ago, and the meeting uh, before the one we just had, 
we got squeezed in between a uh, building committee and a board meeting, so we only had an hour. So we held a special meeting on the 3rd uh, to try and get through some of the things on the agenda. And I think you, I think you were all given a copy of the agenda. Um, we spent a lot of time, uh, Nicole, going through the uh, quarterly reports, and she uh, did a great job of pointing out certain items that should be discussed. Um, one of the items that John brought up was the electricity, and it turned out that uh, the electricity bills would spike when they turned on the electric uh, uh, warmers in the gutters. Uh, you know, to keep the snow from uh, sh uh, clogging up the gutters. But anyway, uh, the conversation then digressed, mainly because I changed subjects on it, to solar power, the swimming pool locker rooms, and the playing fields. And I think that uh, we had a good discussion about those. And then one of the more important things we discussed was the potential of an upcoming uh, referendum uh, for facilities uh, repair and uh, what the timing should be uh, uh, and what items should be included on that. Um, uh, I'm not, we're, we're still putting the list together. We had uh, eight things to start with and I think we're up to 10 now. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the dollar amount, it, uh, Don is still working on getting a couple of numbers uh, uh, for the Booth School for clabbered, new clabbers and things of that nature. Uh, we then went on to the po our policy on local vendors and we discussed that. Um, uh, we did take note that uh, the board had approved two policies on local vendors, uh, 3313.1 and on bidding 3323. Uh, it was generally agreed I think it was more than generally agreed. We all agreed that uh, uh, if uh, the quality of work and the cost and the timeliness were all equal, of course we would want to focus on our, our local people. And we decided to define local as people that were literally in Region 12, one of the three towns, um, not a neighboring town per se, uh, but one of our three towns. Um, we then went on, oh, it was also noted uh, that over 50, just over 50% of all the employees in Region 12 are, reside in Region 12. Uh, so uh, we, we do, we do uh, uh, hire a lot of people from the area. Um, we then went on to the financial audit, which I am happy to say John agreed to do rather than me, and uh, I appreciate that. Uh, we then went into the budgeting process, and uh, uh, we're just starting that right now. And uh, uh, we'll be focusing on that more, I think, at the next meeting. Um, then we, I had a question on uh, what other negotiations were going to be coming up in terms of contracts, et cetera. And uh, Megan outlined uh, you know, what the time frame on those would be. And then uh, finally, we dealt with the amendment uh, to our policies about uh, transfer of funds. And Nicole had come in with three samples uh, from different towns uh, and CABE. And uh, she's going to work on putting together sort of a policy that she feels uh, would be best for our, uh, 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 our school system. And that mm -hmm. is pretty much it. Uh, I've been informed that we are going to negotiate with our nurses union, but I have not, still not been informed as to when that's going to begin. So, I'm waiting for that. Yes, we had a meeting this evening, and basically our two major topics, um, we started off talking about our goals, and everyone was there, by the way, and Joe Abdella joined us as a guest. Uh, so we came up with four broad goals and we're going to drill down on those, um, 
so different members volunteered to take a goal, drill down, come up with measures and how to's and so forth. And we plan to share that loosely with the whole board at our meeting, we think, on May 11th. So in the meantime, on the marketing front, um, we are going to pursue a partnership with Sanders Max. And this is the company, as I think all of you know by now, that is already working with Washington, Connecticut. And we are going to have them meet with the other two towns for selectmen and see if we could have partnerships with those towns and, of course, partner with us as Region 12. So that meeting, we think, is going to happen in early March. And uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, Julie. Um, on to new business and updates. Uh, Multi-age classroom. Hi. Um, in your board packet, I shared the PowerPoint presentation that we gave to the Booth Free uh, community on January 30th. That presentation is also available um, on our YouTube channel. So if anyone has 90 minutes that they really want to watch and see how, how the conversation went. Um, but the reason we actually captured it is because we also want to make certain that we're transparent. Any families who, who weren't able to attend, they have access to the information that's out there. Additionally, um, in the booth free newsletter, we attach the PowerPoint to it so that way everyone knows and can be brought in into the conversation. Um, last Thursday, uh, Teresa, Kathy, um, Stephanie Kolnick, and I were able to present along with some, uh, we had three Burnham parents who also joined so that way they could share their experience. Um, we could have um, small groups in which people could ask questions. They were able to compare some of the data that we have regarding um, our ability to address the standards in a multi-age classroom, to address the transition, to address the curriculum, to talk parent to parent. Um, and so at this time, um, we did receive our survey results. So our next presentation is actually showcasing the model of choice. And I can tell you that at this point, um, overwhelmingly, um, people are much more in favor of a dual um, classroom multi-age model over the model that's at Burnham. So the part that I like about this is this is really a response to what Booth parents have said is their preference if we do go into this direction. And so now catering the next conversations to what does this look like? What does a model schedule look like? How would that impact the days? Um, we also have a um, video that Ben put uh, forth of a day in the life of a student in a multi-age configuration. And it's just showing how things happen in our multi-age classroom. I don't want to get into the, um, into the position of comparing Booth or Burnham. I think this is really trying to design while we can what is best for the community that, that we have before us. And as I, as I have explained to our families at Booth, this is really about trying to create a model that can be sustained. This is also creating change and designing change before change is forced. Um, we recognize the enrollment. We're watching the Prada reports, um, looking out 10 years. Booth has kind of plateaued in what we're anticipating for our enrollment. And so if we have the opportunity to do something dynamic and utilize our resources and really, um, really promote educational um, thinking that allows for some fluidity, it's a perfect time to explore that. So um, again, these, the PowerPoint is shared before you if you have questions. If families have asked any questions, I've given my cell phone number. They can come in and talk. These are things in which um, I would rather have the conversation um, and get the accurate information out there versus something getting ahead of us based on um, people thinking something is um, I, I would just rather have the truth out there. The parent who wrote to the board, mm -hmm. I assume somebody on the board got back to that parent? The parent did forward me the email, and I responded directly back to the parent. I actually appreciate it that they forwarded me the email after the fact. Okay. I just I, wanted I to make so. sure. I didn't know how that protocol went, so. Great. 
Jim. Uh, I'm sorry, Megan. So did you say that as of now, the preference seems to be dual grade level? That is correct. Right, thank you. And Megan, I'm, I'm familiar with Burnham's model since we've been running it for a while now, but I'm not familiar with uh, the dual dual grade. And could you tell us maybe the quick and dirty on that? The, the very quick and dirty, um, and again, in, in the PowerPoint, you'll see it broken down. But the quick and dirty is kindergarten first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. So there would be three classrooms. Um, we would have two teachers, um, a reading teacher and a math teacher that are not assigned as classroom teachers, but would push in during math time and reading time. So we would actually, during math and reading time, have two teachers within each one of the classrooms. And, and as far as you're concerned, are you neutral on the topic of which of those models would offer benefits, or do you think they both offer just different benefits and different, different pros and cons for each one? Um, I think there's different pros and cons for each one. I think right now, looking at the logistics of um, Booth Free, uh, looking at the numbers that are there, um, looking at the space that we have provided, I do have to concur with what the families are leaning towards, which is the dual um, grade level. So I think it is about the space. It is about looking at the populations. It's looking at how we can effectively support each student in the, that classroom. Okay. And then last question, I promise. Oh, no, it's okay. Um, the, um, certainly one of the concerns of, the, of the, the board and the district when we moved into Burnham's configuration was the declining enrollment and, and wanting to provide a quality education while at the same time affording the district some savings. And, and would the option that we're considering for Booth offer some financial savings to to the district or, or no? Um, the current model as um, put forth would have um, two less teachers. Um, one of the things that should be noted is that we do not have to cut staff. Um, we have a retirement that's already been noted and we also have a resignation. So at this time we would have a savings. However, this is not um, fiscally motivated this is really about right sizing and being able to utilize the resources um, in better ways. Uh, Lisa. Um, just on that note um, about being, um, if this is fiscally motivated, I think we need to make that clear as a board um, because people will ask and we need to make sure that it is, that we do present this, that it is not fiscal motivation because um, I was at that presentation and you did a great job. However, there were that questions repeatedly asked in different ways thinking that that would change the answer and it doesn't because they're very, some of the parents were very suspicious of that. So um, I think it's important to make that clear. So, Julie. One more question. So do we anticipate um, a groundswell of parents coming here and presenting to the board, which happened <laughs> multiple times when this w went on at Burnham. I'm just curious if it, it well, how do you see this going? Right now, I, I have to commend the Booth parents because right now I, I have been getting emails. I've been getting questions. Um, we have six presentations. Um, so far, the two presentations that we have provided have been um, well attended. Well, I have to say the first one was more, it was better attended than the second one. Um, but I, I have to tell you, I, I appreciate people when they ask those questions and they are asking smart questions. I think there is suspicion. Um, I think that one of the questions that came up was, is this a backhanded way to do consolidation? And I went very quickly on the record to say, absolutely not. Um, the question of, was well, this financially motivated? You know, is this something the board is doing? It's not. This is an educational decision. This is right now, as we look at what's happening with our enrollment, looking at kindergarten classes that are, are between five and eight right now, it's uh, giving the ability to socialize. It's about making certain that we have 
more certified teachers to support the students and getting expertise in front of the children and finding ways to be fluid in our learning spaces if we could really create a one room that's a library and it actually creates less sensory stimulation um, it is an opportunity it's one in which it's right-sized we probably could have done this last year but quite frankly the attention on agri-science that wouldn't have been fair this is a time Booth deserves the attention. It has been in the shadows for a long time of some of these other dynamic things that have been happening. And so I want to make certain that our energies and resources are put into our, our Roxbury School. Mike. Um, Megan, I don't know if you got this question um, from a parent, but if, if there is a, a Booth parent who said, um, I'm just not sure about the model for my child, um, and I would prefer to send them either to a, the traditional model being Washington or to the model that we heard about from Burnham. Would, would they have that flexibility? Um, the families have the right to request um, any school in the district. They've always had that right. Um, but then what happens is they are responsible for their own transportation. Um, it's not a guaranteed yes. We also have to watch enrollment. We have to watch, but this is about making certain that we're providing equal opportunity at all three of our schools. And again, if there's something that we see is happening and is benefiting students, making that opportunity available to all. Go ahead. Justin, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to um, publicly commend um, the Burnham parents. I sat in on like 30 minutes or so with them and, and they did a fantastic job putting parents at ease and, and speaking you know parent to parent um, the question you know they handled each question wonderfully um, it was just it was great to see so anytime we can get more Burnham parents um, would be excellent and, and help ease the transition um, and I know just to piggyback on that one of the uh, requests was if we could have some of our Burnham students at one of our small groups so that way, um, obviously we do it in a very safe way <laughs> where they don't feel that they're, they're getting questioned. But um, again, we want, we want the honest conversation. And I know Kathy's been open to um, showcasing the other school, but I also, again, I'm not trying to turn Booth into another Burnham or to, like, this is about what are the needs of that school. John? I noted that too. Uh, I, I attended that meeting and um, the Bridgewater parents definitely calm the fears of the uh, Booth parents and and with experience comes knowledge and, and actually educating everyone. I like the idea of the six meetings um, and um, Kathy Coella shared with me, this is the wave of the future actually. You know, a lot of small school districts are being forced to combine classrooms. Kathy Quella told me that um, a school from Massachusetts contacted her. They're building a brand new consolidated school and thinking about age consolidation or class consolidation. There's also a school from, was it Eastern Connecticut? I don't know if she shared with you the same. There's one in Lebanon, but uh, Le yeah. Cornwall is also another school that, that has done it. So we're, we're definitely watching the landscape of the state. So, I mean, we're going to have to customize, possibly even at Washington Primary someday. So, well, you know, it's interesting. I, I I attended the two sessions that have been held so far, and I will tell you that there are. I mean, parents do have concerns. You, you, something like this comes up. And you, how is this going to affect my child? Uh, and you, they're obviously they're, they're they're children's champions, and they want to know that. There's also concern that well, gee, if if I'm if my kid is the uh, is the first grader in a K one. Uh, is that first grader going to be uh, not really learning at the first grade level, but is the whole class going to have to be taken down to a kindergarten level? I mean, by and large, because they don't attend all of our meetings, they haven't been privy to the discussion, they haven't seen and going on over the school and see how it works. But the way we're doing this, with multiple teachers involved in each classroom setting, and with a, you know with an interventionist available, and with uh, with paras and other people available, what you end up with is instead of a teacher in a single classroom with one grade level with four different reading groups that they have to spend time on. Here you have the ability to have each reading group with one person concentrating them for the whole class. As a result, it's actually more time on task. It's potentially an even better way to educate the children 
And I think that the, the, our difficulty, or at least our role, has got to be to explain this, to let people understand what the, what the advantages of this program are over the traditional educational model and how we're doing it and how we're learning uh, from, the, from what we've done before and how we're going to be able to do this in a way that's going to be a major advantage for their children. I think that's something we're trying to work on and trying to do. And I think that more and more people, uh, when they hear that and when they understand it, uh, think that this is worth a look. But you know, you went through it in, in Bridgewater, and you know how difficult it is to get to that point. And that's sort of where we are. But I think that the six sessions will give people an opportunity to get their issues raised. Um, and, uh, and I think it'll be a good thing altogether. And the idea that the class gets pushed down to the lower of the two ages is completely not correct. In fact, it, it elevates everyone, no matter which group they're in, uh, it elevates everyone's performance. And that, that's the thing that, that the superintendent presented. And I think that that's, um, uh, I think that's good. And we, and we also know from, from analysis of scores and other things, the limited data that we have for the limited period we've been doing this, that it, do, it does not appear that, I mean, it appears that the children in multi-age classrooms do just as well or better in terms of understanding and getting the state, um, what the state wants you them to learn. So we, we believe it to be a very good program. And I think the main reason is because the time and attention have been devoted to it by the administration and, and the, the rooms have been properly staffed. Uh, I mean, if the whole idea was to have three classrooms or two classrooms with one teacher in each classroom and that's the end of it, this wouldn't be working the way it is. And it's, it, it, that's why it's not about the money. It's about the delivery of the quality education, of the high-level education, of the better education. We're not satisfied with where we are with three schools of distinction. Uh, we, we want to take it to another level, and I think that's what, that's the message that needs to get out. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say. Yes, Mary. Uh, when's the next presentation? Wednesday at 6. When? At booth 3. And after that? <laughs> I, I, can, I can get the dates to the board. I don't Thanks. want to miss. That'd be great. Yeah, I can't come at 6 on Wednesday. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, let's move on to Ag Science Update uh, program. Megan. Ten minutes on the tape. Do you want to go? Oh, you know what? Uh, how, how much time do we have left on the tape? About eight minutes. I can do it. Okay. <laughs> I, I have faith in my ability. All right. Um, some of the agri science updates that we have. Um, our final lamb was born. Um, Mystique gave birth to a, a ram on Tuesday. Um, we did have some complications with mother and baby, um, and but thank you to the support of Megan Thimble and our local veterinarian. Both mama and baby are doing well, so um, good learning moments, scary learning moments, um, but this is also one in which we really saw the program come together, and um, that's exactly what this is for. Is our students have to learn how to care for animals and recognize distress. Um, so I, I did want to bring to your attention, people had been asking about the business model for the agri-science program, and I wanted to draw people's attention to our business model from my budget presentation last year, and that's actually in your board packet um, that, was, that was put before you. And when we're looking at the numbers that, um, if everybody had, had pulled it up, when we're looking at our numbers, the first thing I want to recognize is the fact that, sorry, I'm turning my page, so I'm looking at the hard copy. Um, the first thing I want to show you is that um, in the presentation that I presented in the original board packet, I had transposed the two numbers um, in my presentation where it was uh, the LEA tuition in cost. I had 6832 in our original. Please know, and all of our numbers, we had corrected it. So we've always used the 6823. Um, we would have liked the nine extra dollars a year, but you know, we, we did hold true to that. So please know in all of our calculations we had. But the part that I want people to see is that if you look at year one, when we had our original numbers, we were looking at 52 students coming into the program. We recognize we do not have the 52 who were in the seats. So that was when we did the budget. That was how many students that we had accepted, we had anticipated enrollment, and we do have the 46 students. Of that, if you look, 
we have 28 students that we're sending uh, from our sending towns. And we have the 28 students who are looking to return. So if you look at year two, we had 28 who were looking to return. That number is actually holding true. Um, our acceptance rate that we had put down was 27 students. Currently, we have the 44 applications from sending towns. We will be watching the caps, but we're also looking towards 27 was a low estimate, but it's just one I want to draw people's attention that when we did this model, we didn't, we have not skewed from what is currently occurring. Looking at our region um, 12 students, and if you notice, we're actually trending higher for our own students for next year. So again, I just want to make certain that we're looking at this is the model that we had put out. I know there's often questions regarding how are we doing, how are we trending. Um, we said we wanted 139 students when it was full. Um, right now, as I said, we had 46. And if we accept another 46, we're already trending above. We're at 92. So again, as we're watching these numbers, I just wanted to make certain that I brought people's attention right back to that. Any questions on that model that we had? OK. Hmm. You might have said it, but I missed it. Um, how many applications do we have for, this, for next year's ninth graders? Um, we have, in total, we have 63 applications. 44 are from Sending Towns. I right. do have one on the way from New Fearfield because she did call me. Today. Okay. Um, so where are you thinking the numbers will be for that class? Um, I, I'm thinking we're going to, our acceptance rate will probably accept, again, 30 and see, well, actually, we'll probably accept around 32, recognizing that not everybody who right. applies will attend. Um, and, but hopefully we'll get 30 okay. students from sending towns. All right, thank you. In addition to the students that we already have. Right. So remember, this becomes the and, not just right. 30, it's and. Right, excellent. Okay. Um, something that it, it uh, happened with to me in the last uh, week or two, and it's something that I think that we need to be prepared for is when an animal dies or has to be put down. And I think we need to be ahead of that so we can anticipate what we're going to do and how to deal with the kids, with the emotional, particularly if they get attached to an animal and uh, uh, you know, the end comes along. So I just wanted to point that out. I think that's, that's well stated, and it is something that we should recognize. There's the emotional attachment, and we also recognize... Um, as we're teaching students about veterinary sciences, it's it's not just about pets. It, it's really so much more than that. And um, sadly, death in and in injured animals is part of that. So I think that's that's well advised. Um, and then the last thing, um, as far as and I was giving you soft numbers when you asked Lisa, but on Thursday we will be reviewing applications. So our next board meeting and probably in our next board update, I will be able to let you know how many students actually qualified for our program next year. OK, I'm going to move on to building status. Uh, we had hoped to have a tour tonight. We're not going to. We'll have it the next meeting. But uh, if you were to tour the buildings, you would see that we are nearing the end of the project. Um, we are uh, more or less, with, ex with a few little tweaks and exceptions, more or less finished within this building and to the south. And we're pretty much uh, up to building F, which is nearly finished. Uh, some floors are being done this week. And uh, we expect that that building will be finished. A, tempor a, a TCO, a temporary certificate of occupancy, was issued. Uh, but it was an issue with the restriction that it, it, that it not be, it'd be only limited to staff occupying the building and not students. That now has been lifted. And we now have the, uh, the ability to have students in the building. Uh, that, that was completely finished. So we're, um, we're just finishing the last t touches up there. Uh, the work that will continue into the spring will, of course, be landscaping. We can't plant seeds quite yet uh, for grass, and we, uh, we can't put in plants right now. But that work will, again, be finished uh, in the spring. Uh, the anticipation is, is that we will be able, 
we are trying to set a date for which we can actually put animals in Building F, and we are waiting until we have completed any hammering and, and banging. Uh, there has been some talk of enhancing one of the finishes on some of the walls in that arena, and that may have to wait until the summer in order for us to accommodate animals at the earliest possible date in there. So that is pretty much uh, where we are. Uh, we are uh, still uh, on track in terms of being uh, a little bit under budget. So. Yes. I'm not going to go into big detail because it makes me look really bad, but I did share this with Megan. I um, had one of my best friends who lives in Bethel come visit me this uh, weekend, and he and I went out for lunch. And he has a six year, uh, sixth grader who's um, head over heels in love with horses. Um, and so I said, well, why don't we just go take a little tour of Chapag while we're here? So I drove him to the barn on Saturday, and we kindly just stepped in and he, they have their horse at a barn in Reading. He was absolutely blown away by what he saw. He was taking pictures, sending them to his wife and his daughter and um, I'm almost done. Okay. And just um, so sh he's going back to Bethel to talk to the superintendent that he knows very well to say that this is a, an, an unbelievable opportunity for our students. So hopefully we're going we're gonna to invite him, the, the whole family up for a tour once it's all over. All right. We're, we're going to. That, that was a great comment. Thank you very much. We're going to take a a, a, re, a little short recess now to change the tape. So I don't know if there are any other questions uh, relating to the building and the status of building, and but that's more or less it. We're uh, we're getting real close to the end. We expect to have most everything done. Uh, except for one or two little tiny things and punch list items, we expect to have everything done within the next two and a half weeks or so, uh, other than the stuff that has to wait till the spring. So that's where we are. Um, financial, Nicole. Um, <clears throat> we had a building committee meeting just prior to this meeting. The committee approved application number 18 from ONG and related soft costs. That takes us uh, for project costs through 1231. The amount of that payment application to ONG was 1.15 million. There was about 30,000 other dollars in soft costs, so we'll get those paid out. The building committee did approve them. Um, to date, the project is 89% completed and 84% paid for because we are holding $1.6 million in retainage. Um, and just to kind of bounce back to the audit for a minute to show how this all connects. Um, if you turn to page 14, which is a list of our major funds, and those are the funds that you're probably most interested in seeing the balances in. This is the governmental balance sheet. I'll give you a minute to get there. If you look at, if you go over five accounts to the capital project fund and you come down to the accounts payable line, that retainage that I just spoke in spoke of at June 30th was about 1.3 million and it's sitting in that accounts payable line as a liability. So that retainage will stay on our balance sheet as a liability until the project is finished and we release it. The rest of that $2.8 million liability is because we had a payment application that had not yet been approved so it was pending payment. So that's just kind of how what we talk about and building committee ties back to our audited statements. Um, and if you want to look at these statements more in depth, if you look at the other, other governmental funds which is the second to last column of 807. Those are our minor funds and those are on page, if you want to see a breakdown of what those specific funds are, those are on page 56 and 57. So those are really the operative pages of looking at our fund balances, our assets and our liabilities. And February is an even month. I like even months because I can put a state application in to draw down more funds on our construction loan. So I'll be doing that this month, and I'll report um, what we requested and what the payment status is at the next meeting. Okay. Very good. Uh, Alex? A uh, quick comment. I want to uh, uh, congratulate Nicole. Mm -hmm. um, the auditor... Uh, one of, Aside from saying what I used to call... An, uh, uh, well, I can't remember what he even used to call it, but the, the, the audit was had no flaws in it. He also said the cooperation, the timeliness, and the uh, accuracy which he received information from us what was was sterling. Yeah. So that all I can say is, thank you. Great nice job. job Thank, Thank you. you. 
Oh, yes, Mary. Um, is are they going to have any kind of um, ramifications of being late? Do, do we get anything for that? You mean from the construction project? <laughs> right. I'll let Greg handle that. Yeah, can you guys speak up, please? The question she asked is if the contractor is going to have any ramifications for delivering the project late. The answer to that question is no. We do not have a contract that requires delivery within a specific period of time. Um, the, the difficulty, though, is, is remember, O&G is on site. They're on site till the project's done. If the project takes a lot of time, they've given us a guaranteed maximum price. And if it takes extra time to do it, it's coming out of the, the time they have to spend there is they're not getting paid anything more for it. So uh, they, as construction manager, have a direct interest in pushing things. Uh, the, the timing things that have delayed us have primarily been from suppliers of materials. That's really where we've had our biggest delays. Um, and, uh, but there have been other delays, and there have been other issues and other, other problems. But, but you know, there, there are with every project. So we're going to get through it. But yes, the biggest disappointment is the fact that it's, it's later than we anticipated. Uh, and we don't seem to have much control over that. Anyone else? If not, I'm going to move on to action items. Uh, we're looking for a motion to accept the fiscal year 2019 Region 12 audit, annual audit report as recommended by the Finance and Operations Committee. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Further discussion? Jim? Yes, it was clean and it's unmodified. All right. Um, further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? Motion carries. Uh, the next action item is to consider, if appropriate, adopt the use of Shipman and Goodwin model policies for Region 12 beginning July 1, 2020. Do you want to say something about that? Um, I had uh, proposed the idea to the board uh, at a um, prior board meeting and so at this time um, trying to get a direction on where to go to for next year if we do want to adopt Shipman Goodwin's model policy um, in wholesale again it, it loses some of the individuality however at this point it also makes certain that our policies are up to date they are reviewed every year uh, aligned with legislation and changes um, so again, it's a question of a lot of the policies we have, we have tailored at this time, um, but the upkeep and the maintenance of them is extensive. And so recognizing um, we're always behind the eight ball. However, we have individualization, or if we want to move towards going to the Shipman Goodwin policy. Uh, Pete. Is there, a, is there a cost attributed to this? Uh, there is a cost um, because we're one of their their clients. It's a three thousand dollar a year cost. Mike, I'm definitely in favor um, of the the proposal to moving with Shipman and Goodwin. Um, having been a member of the policy committee back when we had a policy committee for many years, um, you know Michelle Gore did yeoman's work and untold numbers of hours trying to keep to wrestle that bear and keep on top and it I think was one of her constant frustrations that she was constantly feeling behind the eight ball and that the there was just no way humanly possible to stay on top of all of that as um, one woman on even as a committee um, it was incredibly difficult and um, I think that there's a cost to not doing it too um, and one of those costs is that certain things, certain policies we were non, we were out of compliance with. Um, and that could be dangerous to the board in the long run if we're, if we're doing things like that. I agree. Okay. Lisa? I just want to say I was on that committee with Mike and Michelle and the hours that we spent was, that she spent was unbelievable. So I agree with everything that Michael said and would support this. Anyone else have any thoughts? Well, one of the things I think using Shipman's policies helps me is that it, but more often than not, I would ask the question, 
that, uh, gee, uh, we should go back to our council and ask them about this particular policy. We were using one of the CABE policies. And of course, the, the, the word always was, well, wait a minute, CABE has lawyers, and they put these things together. And, and my answer was, yeah, the, the CABE has lawyers, but they're not our lawyers. And so if, the, if there's some issue in this policy, it's not our lawyer giving it to us. And so I've always felt more comfortable getting advice from our council. And now we don't have to go back to the lawyer on an hourly basis and ask that question because we're getting their policies. Jim. Are we hiring Shipman and Goodwin as our attorneys for this, this service, or are they acting as a purveyor of policies? So well, we rely on them as our counsel for every policy they send to us? Is I, that what you're saying? I, what I'm saying is, is I think we can... I think is there we, an attorney-client relationship for every policy they send us? That, that's the question we have to ask, but I believe that you know, if they're our legal counsel and they sell us a policy, I don't know how, what, what do they say? Do they, do, do they put on their legal counsel hat and say, well, gee, you know, we, we know we sold you this policy, but we don't stand behind it. I mean, I, I, I think the likelihood of there being an issue that counsel might have are, are reduced when they're the ones preparing the policies using their own people in-house, as opposed to a, a fine effort. By, I'm not saying just anything wrong with the CABE policies, but questions would come up and you'd yes. want to know the answer. And I think that we get there faster when it's their policy, as opposed to having someone have to read a policy, figure it out, try to understand what the law is on it. They've already done that work when they've produced the policy. And so that's why I think it's more efficient. It, it might involve a couple of questions. We may want to customize some policies. It may want their advice on that. But at the very least, I think we start with a set of policies that they in-house have figured out. And so we don't have to repeat the effort of figuring out what the law says. At least that was my thinking on it. And I, you know, may or may not be proved right, but we'll see. John. Well, that's the thing. If we uh, disagree with what they're proposing, how do we remedy it? How do we uh, deter from their policy? At great expense. Yeah. But, I, you know, I, I mean, it does raise the, I mean, the question that's raised is, is if you're already paying for CABE policies by our membership, do we want to have a second source and a second amount of money? And I, I think the policies that I've seen that, that Shipman has prepared have been straightforward and a little bit less verbose and I think a little bit easier to understand and to keep yourself within. I think the problem is when you put a, as many policies as we have and make them long, involved, repetitive, or what have you, you run the risk of not being in compliance with your policies. I mean, sometime, if you ever went to a law library and wanted to look up uh, all of the federal regulations, the Code of Federal Regulations that has been adopted, and last time I looked, we were in volume 60-something thousand, uh, of those regulations, you would have, you would need a library this big to house them. And I guarantee you, people, every one day, people walk down the street in violation of some federal law or policy because they're so involved. And, and you need to make sure you've got policies that are geared toward following them. And one of the things Shipman tries to do, because they have a big practice in school law, is they try to create more user-friendly policies. At least that's my, my thinking behind the ones I've read that they've prepared. So, look, I think it's worth a shot to, to, to do it. And if we don't like it, we can, we can make a change after a year. Pete? What is this, a one-year charge, 3000 per yes. year? Okay. I mean, I think we pay more than that now. I, I don't know if because the, 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 we got other things for the membership, but a lot of it is the policy. Because that's a lot of work for a firm or, or, or CABE or anyone else to sit and study every law that comes out and see what the impact is and rethink the policies. That's a lot of work. Do they review what policies we have? Are they going to review the current policies we have? Are they they're going through that to see whether they comply? No, no, we, we, we wouldn't. We would be replacing those policies with these policies. Okay. It would be a replacement of our existing policies. We don't have to do our, we've already done our, our bylaws. We don't have to deal with that, but the policies would be replacement. Yeah, Lisa. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we adopt the use of the Shipman and Goodman model policies for Region 12 beginning July 1st, 2020. Moved and seconded. Is there further discussion? I put it on here for a reason. No, um, <laughs> no it, I, I really think... Um, the amount of labor, the amount of time that we spend during these board meetings, I'd rather spend talking about our practices rather than building the policy. And a lot of times, again, we're, we're chasing the language 
versus the essence of the policy. So I am in support. All right. Any other comments? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Uh, abstaining? Uh, okay, so that's uh, one nay vote and uh, 11 uh, yay votes. Um, at this point, I'd like to um, entertain a motion to go into executive session to discuss, one, the superintendent's mid-year evaluation, two, non-certified staff 2021 salaries, and three, discussion of legal advice concerning strategy and negotiations with respect to pending claims regarding agri-science and science lab construction projects and consideration of actions to enforce or implement legal relief or a legal right regarding agri-science and science lab construction projects. Second? Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? We are in executive session. I suggest we use...